Let's pray together. Father, we thank you at this time and bless your name. What a great God you are. Glorious, powerful, and mighty. Lord, we have come so that you lead everyone up and will exceed pre previous limits in our lives and ministries in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that your word will be clear and plain to everyone. And these words will get into every heart and move us forward to the place you have ordained where we will be. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, we bless the name of the Lord for this opportunity and privilege. For the sessions we're having together today, Monday and Tuesday, we'll be exploring what it means to go beyond the limits that have been set before. Number one, the limits in your own personal life. The limits in your own personal ministry, how can you exceed that limit? You ought to know where you're coming from, where you are today, and where you want to be. Number two, we're looking at the exceeding the limits of other people that have gone beyond us or before us in our country here, in Southern Africa, in Africa, and even all over the world. Any man of God you have known, any woman of God you have known, what limits did they set? And how can we go beyond the limits they have set, both in life and in ministry? We're starting uh, today with First Kings chapter 19, and I'm reading from verse 16. First Kings chapter 19, reading from verse 16, and Jehu the son of Nimshai, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shepherd of Abel Meholah, shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. Here we have two people, in particular Elijah, yeah, the rest of the ministry, and that ministry had its limits. And now God was saying, Elisha will be the one to follow. You will anoint him. When you anoint this Elisha, he'll be a prophet in thy room. And as you compare those two, Elijah and Elisha, you want to see how Elisha exceeded the limit of his own personal life, what he was doing before and what he came to now, and how he exceeded also the limit of the ministry of Elijah. In verse 17, it tells us, it says, and it shall be, it shall come to pass, that him that escaped the sword of Azel shall be shall Jehu slay, and uh, him that escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha stay. Again, you have comparison here. You have uh, Jehu, and then you have Elisha. And it says those who escape the sword of uh, Jehu, Elisha will slay. But you understand, Elisha was a prophet, and he didn't carry the sword, the physical sword. He never used the physical sword, and yet he used another sword, the sword of the word. And the sword of the word spiritually in his life, in his ministry, went beyond the literal sword in the engagement of Jehu. We're coming to verse 18. It says in verse 18, yet have I left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. Again, we have other people here that knew the Lord, that served the Lord, and the Lord attested of them, and he said it was seven thousand, and yet we come to Elisha. How Elisha exceeded and went beyond the life of those seven thousand people, the impact of his ministry, and the penetration of his ministry ministry, how Elisha exceeded the life and the ministries of all those 7,000. Verse 19, in verse 19, it says, so he departed this, and he found Elisha, the son of Shepherd, who was plowing with 12 yoke of 
oxen before him. That's the ministry he had before. That was his life before. Now he's going to be called to a ministry higher than when he was using 12 yoke of oxen. And he was the 12, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. From what we have seen already, you will see that we can exceed our past. We can exceed our, pre our previous life, and we can exceed our previous ministries. Today, I'm talking unto you on the basis of the life of Elisha. And the ministry that he had, we're talking on exceeding previous limits of life and ministry, exceeding previous limits. If you didn't know, if you didn't investigate, if you didn't find out the limits of your past life and the, mini, the limits of your previous life, you will not know how you exceed. You have to gauge, you have to measure, you have to know, you have to find out. This was my limit before today, before coming to this conference. And now I'm having impartation, I'm having a new mantle coming upon on my life for a greater ministry. And then years to come, if Jesus tarries, we'll be able to measure how far we've gone and how higher we've gone because we're going to exceed previous limits of life. Life, your personal life, life, your family life, life, your professional life, life, your spiritual life, that we're able to say, this is where I was and this is where I am now. Life in Christian experiences. I was saved, no doubt, and I belong to the Lord, no doubt. But now I can have an experience, a Christian experience that will go beyond where I was before. Because if I am today what I was 10 years ago, if I am today what I was 20 years ago in Christian experience. And all the testimony I can give is I was at this time, at this spiritual level. And then today I'm still saying the same thing. How am I exceeding the previous limits of my life in Christian experience? And now in ministry, in ministry, how deep is the ministry? How high is the ministry? How broad is the ministry? In which way am I exceeding previous limits? And how spiritual, how saintly, how secret is the ministry I've got? If I do not measure and I do not find out, I'll not be able to know whether you are going down or you are going up, whether you are expanding or you are shrinking, but it's because you measure. It's because you think about it in your mind. You are able to say, looking at the parameters and looking at all the, all the instruments I can use to gauge myself, I'm exceeding previous limits of life and ministry. And uh, we're looking at Second uh, Kings chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 15. Uh, Second Kings chapter 2 verse 15, uh, and when the sons of the prophets which were to view, to watch, and to see what had happened at Jericho, they saw and saw him, uh, they said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on uh, Elisha. Yes, but no. The spirit of Elijah does rest upon Elijah. Qualitatively, yes. The spirit of Elijah does rest upon Elijah. Quantitatively, no. A double portion had come. It's not just a single portion that the spirit of Elijah came on Elisha as you look at the extent of his ministry and as you look at the impact of his ministry, as you look at the nature of his ministry. If you compare the miracles in the ministry of Elijah with the miracles in the ministry of Elisha, you see they of different kinds. In the ministry of Elijah, it was the miracle of judgment upon Ahab, upon the Baal worshippers. If you think about the ministry of Elijah,
fire, he called fire down on the first 50, on the second 50, and you'll see it was the ministry of judgment because of the time he lived on around and look at the ministry of Elisha you see a different kind uh, that water is bitter and is causing death and it was healed and as you look at the people that were taking the meal there is poison uh, death in the pot and then they cast out the meal it was all right and the dead that were raised and uh, the, the famine uh, that was uh, stopped you see it was a different kind but not only that as you count all the miracles in the ministry of Elijah and you count the miracles in the ministry of Elisha those of Elisha, they were double those of Elijah. So to say, the spirit of Elijah does rest upon Elisha qualitatively yes, quantitatively no. He had a double portion. And we can tell as we look at Elisha, this was a minister that had the double portion and he exceeded the limit set before him. I'm asking you a question. What limit are you going to rise up to? If you just came uh, to listen to the message, you enjoy the message without a plan, without a purpose, and without any measurable progress, you will not know you are exceeding limits, but we don't want to come to a conference like this as usual. We want to find out what can I do? What can you do? What can we do? Number one, as individuals. Number two, as associations of uh, ministers and as a church together in our various countries we came from, uh, what can we do that we exceed the limit of the levels of living, Christian life, ministerial life, and the, and the limits of ministry exceeding previous limits of life and ministry. Three things I'm looking at here. Number one, burning the bridge behind. Burning the bridge behind before burning for God. If we're going to burn and shine for God like John the Baptist, it was a burning light, a shining light. If we're going to be like that, number one, we burn the bridge behind before we can burn for God. Number two, bonding with the benefactor before his baptism from God. He had a baptism of power. We can have a baptism of power, a baptism in mansion, in love, a baptism in a dynamite that the dynamo lives inside you and all around you and you have this air of power anywhere you go because there is a baptism from God and you bond with the benefactor. Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. As the Lord lives, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And they went together. And the sons of the prophets came to Elisha. Do you know that God is going to take away your master from your head today? I know it. Hold your peace. Those were people that didn't have any purpose. They knew Elijah was going. They knew he'll be taken away from the earth. And since the time of Enoch, that had not happened to anybody. And they knew that this would be the next man to Enoch and the Lord will take him away they saw the vision but they didn't have insight there are people that have eyes to see and they see vision they see this and this but they don't see reality they don't see what's in it for me Elijah is going today I can see Elijah now I can touch him I can interact with him but soon chariots will come from heaven and take him away what is in it for me? And that's the reason why Elisha said, hold your peace. I have a goal. I have a purpose. I have a dream. I have a desire. I have something I'm going to get. This is not the time to talk. I want to exceed the limits of this man of God. And I want to exceed the limits of my past life. Therefore, they went together. Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Gilgal. He wasn't a man that will stay back. 
just an onlooker. Just a person that will be looking at what was happening. He had something in, the, in this. A bondage with the benefactor. He remained with that benefactor and he said, as your soul lives, as God lives, I'm not going to leave you. And they went together. They got to Jordan River Jordan and Elijah took his mantle. He was watching because what you see is what you get. What you get determines what you do. If you don't see anything, if you don't get anything, you will not do more than you had done before. He was watching Elijah and Elijah took the mantle and smote the water and the river parted in two. He said, I see that what I see I seize what I seize, I perform, and they went together. And uh, so Elijah, for the first time, said, Elisha, there must be something in your heart to bond with me like this, and to go along with me like this. You must have something. What? do you want? He could have asked for a lot of other things, long life, good health, good family, good funding for, you know, his life and whatever he will do, and a good road map. He could have asked for, have you written anything? Because the Lord said, I'll be a prophet in your room. Have you written down all those things that I can go through and be having checks on them? When I achieve them, he could have asked for any other thing, but he said, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Be upon me. Why did you ask for that, Elisha? If the spirit is there, the provision will be there. If the spirit is there, power will be there. If the, if the, if the spirit is there, everything I need for life and ministry will be there. So instead of asking for one, two, three, four, ten, twenty, thirty, a hundred, I ask for that one thing that will bring all the rest into my life. We need to have that in Side, that foresight, and we need to have uh, the sight of what the Lord wants to achieve through us. Number three is blessings from benef uh, for beneficiaries beyond his borders through God. When you look at Elisha, he had ministry that went beyond Israel. He had ministry that went beyond his locality. Look at Naaman coming from Syria. That's beyond Israel. Look at all those people coming that wanted to catch Elisha, capture him, and get him off that land of Israel. They were coming from outside. And look at all those things that happened, the multiple of the meal and everything. Everything went beyond his borders. He was looking for a man that exceeded his borders, that exceeded his limits. We see that man in the Old Testament in Elisha. Blessings for beneficiaries, for other people. Because he asked for the spirit not for himself, but for ministry, for what he can do, and for what he will be, what he will achieve in the lives and the ministries of other people. Blessings for beneficiaries beyond his borders through God. We're looking at number one. Number one, we're looking at burning the bridge behind before burning for God. We're coming to 1 Kings chapter 19, and I'm reading from verse 19. So he departed thence, and he found Elisha, the son of Shephat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. Have you discovered that when God meets you and where God meets you is very important when God calls you. I don't see anyone being called lazy, idle, loafing, not doing anything. Think about the course of the people of God in the Bible. Moses, he was doing something when the call came. And think about Joshua doing something when the call came. Think about Elisha here. He was plowing when the call came. Think about Peter. He was fishing when the call came. Think about John and James. They were fishing when the call came. Think about Matthew. It was at the receipt of customs when the call came. 
the people that receive the call of God, the natural talent the Lord has given them, they're making use of those natural talents, and now the spiritual part will come on top of that. If you, there are people that are waiting in idleness. Why are you not doing anything? I'm waiting for the call of God. It doesn't come that way. Why are you idle? Why are you just loafing about? You wake up in the morning. All you can do is go here and go there and be a busy body in other men's matters. Why? Because I'm waiting for a calling. The calling doesn't come that way. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen and he was worth the 12. And it says Elijah passed by and cast his mantle upon him. Now, when we have the call of God, we must have interpretation. If we don't have interpretation, we'll never understand the call has come. Has God ever called you, my brother? I'm still waiting. I want to hear his voice from heaven. Like Paul heard the voice and he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. It doesn't always come that way. As Elijah passed by, he didn't say anything to Elisha. Elisha, isn't that your name? Yes, sir, that's my name. I have the word of knowledge. How could I have known that you are Elisha? Do you know something? God has told me to come to you and to anoint you. If you're looking for anointing from the bottle of oil, you might miss the anointing. Anoint him to be a prophet like you are instead of you. And Elijah did not carry a bottle of oil and say, Elisha, come on here and put the oil on him or pour the oil on him. It was different. In fact, he said nothing. He just passed by and as he was passing by, the Lord said, that's the man and you are the man and you are the woman and just throw the mantle upon him. No voice but his action. Don't you know sometimes actions speak louder than words. And in the case of Elijah to Elisha, the action spoke volumes because his cast his mantle upon him. The first day they met, it was the mantle. Uh, run, you know, to the end of the story between Elijah and Elisha. If you see me, then it will be yours. And then the chariots came. And he said, my father, and the chariot of Israel. Again, no voice, but the mantle dropped. On the first day, it was the mantle. On the final day, it was the mantle. And our man, Elisha, got the story. He knew that is mine. There was no pronouncement. There was no laying of hands. There was no anointing with oil. That's what I was asking for. And he picked that mantle. And you must test the mantle. And he got to Jordan and he said, where is the God of Elijah. Elijah is gone. His God is still here. The chariots are gone, but the God of Elijah is still here. And he rolled the mantle together. And first of all, he removed his own mantle. Isn't that what he did at the first time? That he burnt that yoke of oxen and he said, I burned the bridge behind me. Now the final time. And he he took his own mantle and removed that and threw that away because he got a higher mantle. What are you getting today? Higher mantle? A greater mantle? If you say amen, we will not close the meeting. Now, when you understand that this is what God wants to give you and this is the way he gives you. Now, comparison is sometimes dangerous. And there are people that limit what they get from the Lord because they're waiting for an experience like Paul, the soul of Tassos. When God stops me on the way to Damascus, my Damascus, and he speaks from heaven, and I hear that, and 
days and then I'm blinded and I go three days fasting and when I do that and there's Ananias that come and said brother Saul the Lord that appeared to you in the way has sent me to you that your eyes will be opened and you receive the Holy Ghost when it happened to me like that I will know God has called me comparison could be very deceptive you know it, the mantle was the way God called Elisha. He didn't call Moses that way. And he didn't give him another thing. There was already a rod in the hand of Moses. What's that in your hand? A rod? Okay. I will not make that beyond the rod of Moses. It will be the rod of God. So, don't compare Moses and Elisha. Don't compare Joshua and Elisha. He calls us in different ways. And he calls us to different things. He was passing by and he cast the mantle on him. Look at verse 21. In verse 21 it says and he returned back from him and he took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and he gave unto the people and he did eat and then he, Elisha arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. He burnt the bridge behind. Uh, there are things we, we need to burn. You look at you know, your previous life, your previous engagement, your, pre uh, your previous uh, preoccupation, and the things you are doing. And you say, this will not have anything to do with the new life I have, or the new ministry I have. I have to burn them off. What will those a yoke of oxen have to do with the new ministry of Elisha. Elisha knew that all the yoke of oxen he had in the past will have nothing to do with the ministry coming upon his life. And he said, that has to go. That has to go. That has to go. In your life, have you ever thought about anything? Anything that has to go? That must go. That one, I must burn. That bridge that connects me with the past. Look at three things here. Number one, number one, we're looking at burning the bridge that connects us with former encumbrances, former entanglements, the things we had in the past, and the bridge that connects us with them, we burn the bridge that connects us with former encumbrances. Number two, building the bridge that conveys us to future engagements. You burn the other bridge, you build this or the bridge. There are people that say, I don't do this. I don't touch that. I don't drink that. I don't smoke that. Good enough for you. I hear of what you don't. Let's say of what you do. Because you see the negative and the positive, uh, you know, lies must come together before we have the light of life and the light of your new ministry. Burn that past. Build that present and then you can walk on the bridge you have built now for the new day. Number two then is building the bridge that conveys us to future engagements. Number three is breaking down barriers that cut many from fruitful enlistment. We hear about Elisha. We must think about ourselves. What the good, what the use for me? What's the use for you? If I hear all this about Moses, all this about Elisha, all this about Peter who left the net, and about James and John that caught their 
connection with the previous engagements and then they build a new thing. What's the use for me if I only hear and I do not transfer into my life? That's when we have number three there. Number three is breaking down barriers that cut many from fruitful enlistment. We're looking at number one here. Number one is burning the bridge that connects us with former encumbrances. We've read that already as it says that he made a meal of the oxen and he had burnt all the instruments that he had. If you uh, read the, pro the parables of Jesus Christ, sometimes we just go through those parables and there are, when you read those uh, parables, there are prophetic um, uh, fulfillments in some of the parables but there are personal fulfillments in some of those parables. Take the one from Luke chapter 13 and you look at this vineyard reading there from verse 7 and it says then uh, said he unto the unto the dresser is a vine of his vineyard behold these three years I come seeking fruit on this tree and find none. I've I've been seeking fruit on this tree. I find none. Are there some trees in my life? Are there some plantings in my life that they occupy the ground and they encumber my life? Watch. They don't produce any fruit that will add to the value of the calling and of the ministry that God had given me. Are there some trees not bearing fruit? Look at your life. Are there some engagements? Are there some preoccupations? Are there some things you spend time, you spend life, you spend money, you spend everything on, and it does not yield any fruit unto your ministry? Those are the things we're looking at. It will be different for you than for me. It may not be the same thing for you or for me that, you know, those things in our lives that like trees and we're seeking fruit on this tree and there is none. It say cut it down. Why compress each the ground. I look at this area of my life, of my ministry, and the things I run after, and the things I engage in, and I say, is that bearing any fruit? Is that bringing any addition? Is that bringing any multiplication of the use of the talents and the gifts the Lord has given me? I checked up the previous year, and I'm checking up this year, and I've been checking up now for three years, for seven years, for ten years, and I see that even though I know so not show that tree and that engagement and that aspect of my life is not yielding any fruit. The Lord is saying, cut it down. Why should it occupy the rest of your life? Cut it down. We're burning the bridges behind us so that we can now burn for God. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 4. 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're looking at uh, verse 4. It says, no man that worries entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Affairs of this life, they sometimes become entanglements. And, and it starts in small, small ways. If you were to experiment, you don't need to experiment, I will tell you that something, you know, a rope, a cord binds your two hands, entangles your hand, and binds them, and holds them together to the point that you cannot cut the rope by yourself anymore. The engagements of the world, the affairs of this life, the affairs, they're not even necessarily sinful. They're just entanglements. They just make you have your mind, your heart, your vision all entangled. It's like the swan went forth to sow the seed and some fell among the thorns and the thorns choked them. And Matt tells us 
in chapter 4, verse 19, it says, the desires for other things entering in, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the things of this life coming in, choke the world, and it becomes unfruitful. Those are the entanglements, and those are the encumbrances that it says no man that worried entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he might please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. What pleases him that chose us to be soldiers is not, you know, coming before the Lord and smiling at him now for a soldier that doesn't please the captain who put him on the battlefield and he says, this is why you are in the army. We must know why we're in the army of the Lord. It's not that you know what pleases the captain. You build your body. You become a bodybuilder. You are strong. That may prepare you for what you ought to do, but that not the end of the story. Let's find out what pleases the one who died for the whole world. What pleases him who gave his life that everyone might be saved. Am I doing that? Am I in that ministry? Am I pleasing the Lord by bring, bringing sinners out of their darkness, out of their dungeon, out of evil, and coming out to the Lord? What pleases the master that I have, uh, you know, 50 people in my congregation and the 50 are always there. But he said, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them I must bring in. And if I only concentrate on the 50 and sometimes I move them around, I say, you sit in front and you sit at the back. It's only rearrangement. There is no growth there. And the other sheep are not coming in Find out in your life what pleases the master. Find out in your ministry what pleases the master. And anything that will engage you and draw you out and entangle you, uh, that you will not be able to fulfill what he has called you for, you need to burn the bridge before or behind it. Look at verse 5. In verse 5 it says, and if a man also strive for masteries. If a man also strive for masteries. Now, when he says uh, mastery, the athletes they do that quite a lot. The athletes that prepared for the Olympics of those days, at the time of Paul the Apostle, they say, there was a way they built themselves, there was a way they practiced every time, and there was a way they went to engage on the field. But Peter, will not look at an athlete and do exactly what the athlete was doing. The example of the athlete is just an illustration. That doesn't send me out on the sideways and trotting every day. It doesn't send me to the Olympics doing the same thing they were doing. As they are faithful in what they are doing, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to prepare? How am I supposed to equip myself? Because if a man also strive for mastery, masteries in the calling the Lord has given you, yet you see not crowd except you strive lawfully. We're coming to number two. After burning the bridge behind, we need to build the bridge that conveys us to future engagements. Future engagements now. Before we build the bridge, we must look at this part of the road. We look at the river that hinders us from going over that river and going to the next part. I, I don't just begin building without looking at what's past, what's present, what are the hindrances hindering me to get to that future engagement? What's the future engagement? What's the dream? What's the vision? What's the passion? And what is it I have over there on that other side? Now I know the bridge I'm going to build. Because you know, if you build a bridge, and the bridge after you spent all your resources, 
and everything you have, and you finish building the bridge, and you cross over to the other side of that bridge, and it's barren land. This is not what you are looking for. This is not what you are expecting. Now I built the bridge before you spend time and spend effort and spend everything you have building the bridge. Look at that future engagement you are going for. And that's what all those ministers did. All those people that received their calling, they knew where they were going. And so, because they knew where they were going, they knew the future future engagements that why they knew what to burn up and they knew what to build so that they'll be able to cross over i pray you'll be a wise builder a wise master builder and then you'll be able to say praise the lord where i am today is because of the bridge i built before today you will build and the bridge will carry you to the place you ought to go. Now, when the builders build bridges, they look at the kind of heavy lorries, materials that will go over the bridge. That's why the bridges are different. The bridge over that stream it's different from the bridge over this river. It's different from the bridge over this ocean. You see, I'm saying all this so that we'll know the practical things to do. Look at that uh, other minister is building a bridge. I look at the dimensions. I look at the strength. And I look at, you know, the, the, the concrete. And I do exactly the same. Now, before you do exactly the same, are you going to send on that bridge exactly what the other minister is going to send on the bridge? Is his bridge wide enough for your vision? Is his bridge heavy enough and strong enough for your calling? You must find out where am I going? How am I going there? And now I am building the bridge. Now, he's building the bridge if he's putting some wood together. It may take him one month. My building the bridge might take me more than one year because I am building a bridge different from the, the bridge is building but the point is, look at your life, look at your calling, look at your ministry, and build the bridge that conveys you to the future engagement. We're looking at uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 2. In 2 Kings chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 2, it tells us in verse 2, it says, Elijah said unto Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. There are some decisions I have to take as an individual that the other person does not have to take. Look at the 50 sons of the prophets. Do you know the Lord is going to take your master away from your head today? Now, they were not following Elijah over Bethel. Can I copy them? They are sons of the prophets. They are students in the ministry in the school of the prophets and they already have some gifts of revelation and is my ministry my gift. Do I want it to be limited to the vision and the gift of the sons of the prophets? You can decide and then you can say okay uh, it looks like you have revelation and looks like you have vision. Looks like like you have at least one of the gifts of the spirit. I see it with you here. You see it with them if that is the limit of your calling. If that is the limit of your ministry. But if your ministry and your calling goes beyond theirs, you'll tell them, stay where you are, where you want to stay. I am going on. Somebody there, you are going on. And then even Elijah said, stay here. And then he said, I will not leave this. So they went to 
Bethel. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, it tells us, And Elijah said unto him, Tarry here, Elisha, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. It's okay to say the same thing when you are confronted with the same challenge. The same challenge, stay here, I will not leave thee. And then they got over Bethel, and they went now to Jericho. Stay here. The same challenge, the same answer. And there's nothing wrong in saying the same thing, because he also was saying the same thing. Stay here. And he said, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it says, And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. Now, Elijah is saying the same thing. You know? Have you been confronted by, you know, people? They have good hearts. They have good intention. They don't mean any evil. And they say the same thing. You know? This is too much for you. It's okay for me. I'm of a different constitution and I have a different calling and I'm going over there. You stay here. You might hear the same thing. And uh, what you hear is not what discourages you. It is what you interpret of what you heard that discourages you. It discouraged me. No, it didn't discourage you. He said something, and his words discouraged me. No, his words did not discourage you. It's your interpretation. It's your understanding. It's the limit of your vision that made you to interpret what he said, and your interpretation discouraged you. He was not the only one. Now, me said, look at your sister-in-law. She's gone back to her idols. You go back also and let me go alone to my land. Now, Ruth could have said, she discouraged me by what she said. No, it's your interpretation. And Ruth said, don't tell me to leave you. Where you go, I will go. And where you dwell, I will dwell. God do so to me and more also. If anything except death, but you and I. I'm sure you've had some words in your life, in your ministry, in your family that you could have pointed back to and say, you know, I would have been like this uh, pastor ministering. Why it not for what so and so told me? They said I could not. They said I would be wasting my life. I'll be wasting my time if we gave opportunity to everyone here to say what somebody told them in the past that should have made them to sit down where well, I have many stories to tell. But it's not what they say. It's your interpretation of what they said. After all, in fact, what Elijah said was not coming from his heart. How do you know that? Because Elijah remembered this, the young man that will become a prophet in my room. But he needs to be tested. And so I'm giving him a test. But I'm not going to say, Elisha, testing, testing, testing. Stay here. Now, if you said that, everybody will know he shouldn't stay. He didn't shout, testing, testing, testing. He just brought out the test. There are many things that come into our lives like test. But nobody gives us a previous warning, testing, testing, testing. I pray when your test comes, you'll pass the test. It's the people that pass the test that cross over. The people that do not pass the test and they have wrong interpretation, they never go over any mountain, any river, any Jordan. I will pass my test. The problem is the test sometimes doesn't have the time and the date like our children have at school at this time you are going to have the test hours 
We do not know when. It might be this morning. It might be this afternoon. It might be at the threshold of the greatest manifestation of power you ever received in your life. But be watchful and you will pass the test. And it says, I will not leave thee. And day two went on. Day two went on. I am going on. We're looking at number three here. Number three is breaking down barriers that cut many from fruitful enlistment. Breaking down the barriers. Now, we may not hinder ourselves or cut ourselves away from fruitful engagement. We may block other people. We may hinder other people. Luke chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 49. Luke chapter 9, verse 49, and John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him. Why? Because he followeth not us. If you think of what one minister could do, and think about what ten ministers could do, and think about what 100 ministers could do, then you understand what we're talking about on removing the limits, not only in your life, but in the lives of other people. If one man could do this, what could you do? And what could three do? If Peter could preach one message and uh, 3,000 can come uh, into the kingdom of God with one uh, message. Now, what are we going to do with Philip? What are we going to do with um, Stephen? What are we going to do with the other five of the seven? Now, the apostles said something great and something beautiful when they said, it is not meat, it is not right for us to leave the word of God and to serve tables. Great. And so, let us look for seven men of honest report. Let's look for seven men who are full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. What do you mean it, apostles? You're looking for men who are full of the Holy Ghost? Why did God fill them with the Holy Ghost? They shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. Nobody is filled with the Holy Ghost to serve tables. We may remove the limits in our personal lives and personal ministries and then we put the limits on the ministries of all the people. And so they chose Stephen and they chose Sir Philip and they chose the others. What are we to do apostles? We are laying hands on you. We are not laying hands on you because you are not filled with the, you are filled with the Holy Ghost already. We are laying hands on you so that you will distribute food in the local assembly. And so they chose them. But persecution reversed what the apostles had put in place. And Philip was in Samaria. And he had the Holy Ghost. And this is not what the apostles anointed, laid hands, appointed him for. What they appointed him for, that was now passed. The persecution had burnt the bridge behind. Here now, we're told, and he preached Christ. And then it said, the whole city, they turned to the Lord, and it was great joy in the city. If we're not careful, we can pin down, we can peg down, we can tie down some Phillips that are there, break down 
the barriers that caught other people from fruitful engagement. The whole city came to the Lord, and the Enoch of Ethiopia came to the Lord, and at the end of chapter 8, a miracle that never happened to any of the apostles happened to him. After baptizing the Enoch of Ethiopia, and the Enoch went his way, the Spirit of the Lord caught him in an invisible aeroplane, and he found himself in as sort of the point I'm making is as you cut the cord and as you burn the bridge concerning your own personal life, look at Philip, help him, and don't put him where his engagements are limited. And he has more gifts, and he's not even going to use that gift in uh, you know distributing food, but send him to the place, allow him to see the vision that this is what he could be. And then Stephen, we're told when the people look at the face of Stephen, it was like we're looking at an angel. And he did many miracles and wonders among them too. The point is, help other people also to see they should burn the bridge behind them. They should build the bridge that will take them to future engagements. And they should also break the bonds and, the, and break the barriers that caught other people around them from fruitful enlistment. I pray this will be your day. That the past now, we can get away from the past. We may there for so long a time. Uh, may we go around for 40 years. That's enough. We're getting to the promised land. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two is bonding uh, with the benefactor for his baptism uh, from uh, God. Now, when we talk of baptism, it means an immersion. An immersion, it so happens that in Acts chapter 2, is immersion in the Holy Spirit. But you know, the fruit of the Spirit is love. We can be immersed in love, baptized in love. The fruit of the Spirit is joy and peace. We can be so overwhelmed and baptized in the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. We can be so baptized and immersed in the peace of the Lord that within us and around us we're immersed in the peace of the Lord. Many people that say I'm baptized and the Holy Ghost will say that's great and that's wonderful. Why are you not baptized in love, immersed in love? Why are you not baptized in joy, immersed in joy. Why are you not baptized in peace? Because anyone that says his might on the Lord, the Lord will give him perfect overflowing peace. Why are we not baptized in all those uh, fruits of the Spirit? And then we're just in them and they are in us. When we are baptized in water by immersion, the water is inside, the water is around, and the water refreshes us on the inside and on the outside. So the baptism we're talking about here is not a limited baptism. The baptism of power, the baptism of love, the baptism of the peace of God, and the baptism in the gifts and the graces of the Spirit of God, bonding with the benefactor for his baptism from God. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, bonding together whatever the cost. Bonding together whatever the cost. Uh, why do we put whatever the cost there? You know, it was costly for Elisha to bond together with Elijah. First of all, he was an accomplished farmer an accomplished uh, worker because he was, uh, he was uh, plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. And now he left all that and what we find Elisha's doing now, just pouring water on the hand of Elijah. Elisha, do you forget who you were? A professional man, an accomplished man, a successful man with that great successful achievement. And all you are doing now is pouring water on Elijah's hand. And Elisha says that the cost of bonding with my 
benefactor. There's a cause. There's a price we pay for bonding with the benefactor. And whatever the cause, you want to bond together. Number two is beating temptations, whoever the cause, whoever the cause. You see, sometimes there are respected people that unknowingly become sources of temptation. Here comes Jeremiah, and he brought the sons of the Rechabites into the house of the Lord, and he said, drink wine. Now, we could have risen. He's a prophet. He's been ordained by the Lord before the time of his birth. And this is a prophet to the nation to pull down and to throw down and to build and to get everything up. And he must have a good reason for this as a prophet of God. And he says, drink wine. You see, sometimes the temptation is coming from from uh, people, you, they cannot do evil. They cannot say evil, and they cannot direct me in the direction that I shouldn't go. How do you know? Beating temptations, whoever the cause. Number three is bridling the tongue whenever they cross. Bridling the tongues whenever. They cross. Whenever they cross beyond their, their boundary, the sons of the prophets didn't know why I am following Elijah so intimately. The sons of the prophets do not know the depth of my calling and the height of my ministry and the breadth of my achievement, future achievement. They think I'm just like them. And so they use their tongue and they say, do you know, do you know, do you know, in three places and I bridle those tongues whenever they cross my calling. Whenever they cross my ministry, whenever they cross my intention, where I ought to go, I don't only bridle my tongue, I bridle their tongue so that if my tongue will not get me into trouble, their tongue too will not get me into trouble. These are things we do so that we cross over to the place we need to cross over to. Look at number one. Number one is bonding to together whatever the cause it tells us in second kings chapter 2 verse 2 it says in verse 2 elijah said unto elisha tarry here i pray thee for the lord has uh, sent me to bethel what does that mean you stay zero speed i go and I'm going with eagerness. I'm increasing my speed. And the more he goes, and I stay, the wider the gap between us now. He is going to be the cause. I've never said no to you, Elijah. But now I have to say no. That's the cause. How could I look at the face of Elijah and say no to him? Sometimes I have to do that so that I keep bonding with the benefactor. Look at number uh, verse 4 there. In verse 4, and Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said that the price will pay. Even though you are tired, you don't say so. Even though you are weary, you don't say so. Even though you are tired of even hearing the same thing over and over, you don't say so. You appear excited. You look excited. You look like there's something on the inside of you driving you. And you don't want to, you know, give Elijah the idea to say, after all, you are tired. After all, you are weary. After all, since we came and we have been going on this final journey, you have not taken eating anything. You don't want to give Elijah that kind of understanding, but he said, I will not. Now, that is a decision of your will, of your will. It's not emotion. It's not your feeling. It's not your feeling excited. It's not seeing revelation. We've had enough revelation. 
we know the Lord is going to take him away. He's going to leave me behind. If I don't get into that chariot that Elijah is going by, there must be a heavenly reason, a divine reason why I'm left behind. If I have not died, if I am still alive, if I am still breathing the breath of life, there must be a divine reason why I am breathing at this time. Know the reason you're still alive. I know the reason Elijah is gone and you are here. I know the reason the person who brought you in into the gospel, he died at the age of 53 and then at 54, at 60, you're still alive. Know the reason why that you are still here now and he said, I will not, Elijah. It's a matter of the will. And my will is not that shaky. And my will is not that unstable. And my will is not that that the wind can sway. I've made up my mind until I spend the last minute with you. I will not leave you. That is the cost of bonding. And he said, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, and Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. Now, Jordan, that's a river. And since I knew Elijah, he has never parted any river in two for anyone to cross over because he has never shown the similar ministry of Moses. And so if we go to Elijah, this is my decision. I will never leave you. I will never leave you. And then my decision gets me to Jordan. What will I do? Don't worry. You cross the bridge when you get there. I said, you'll cross the bridge when you get there. Amen. The river, difficult to cross, don't worry, get there first. The river, and when Jordan overflows, it sweeps everything on its way. Don't worry, get there first. You see, sometimes we die a thousand deaths before we die. We fear this. What will happen after Elijah is gone? Because I've been told in three different places, the Lord is going to take your master away from your height today. And we're not on the other side of Jordan. How do I come back? Don't worry about coming back. The Lord will take you to where your ministry is. And so he said, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. You and I will go on. Amen. I said you and I will go on. Amen. They went on. You see, that's the secret. The secret is the secret of perseverance. It's the secret of going on and going on and going on. And you know, it, we do not mark our papers like our lecturers mark our papers. One, two, three. And I got two out of three, six, six, six percent. And then they say, I have credit. And now I've got a good certificate. You know, it doesn't work like that in the spiritual. Because you crossed over in Bethel, one out of three. And then you came to Jericho, two out of three and now i'm going to jordan i've got two out of three 66 percent i made it no in the spiritual that's failure in the spiritual the mantle doesn't come in the spiritual the calling in the ministry and the calling to the ministry is not affirmed and confirmed because we got two out of three we must go on you must go on Amen. i am going on and good enough the strength that got me over Bethel, that same strength will get me over Jericho. 
And good enough, the strength that got me over Bethel and Jericho will get me through Jordan. And good enough, the mantle. I don't have the mantle now. Elijah has the mantle. He didn't even allow me to touch that mantle. He just rolled it together and he parted River Jordan. But I see that mantle. Is using it now on my behalf. And I will use it just in a few hours on behalf of other people. The mantle you see is the mantle you get. The mantle you get is the mantle that works for you. Now, the mantle you don't get cannot work for you. It's the one you follow after. You follow after. You follow after. And then, eventually, that mantle drops. It didn't drop for any other person. Think about it. Think about it. All the sons of the prophets were not around. If that mantle came down like that, as Elijah went off, it's only for one person, for one person who endured until the end of that journey and he picked it up. When that mantle comes for you, you will know it is yours. You'll pick it up. And God will do what only he can do in your ministry in Jesus' name. Look at number two here. Number two here is beating temptations, whoever the cost. Whoever the cause. L look at uh, Second uh, Kings chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 3. In verse 3, and the sons of the prophets were at Bethel. That what Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today when one person does it? That's strong enough to beat a man back. When two people, ten people, when the chorus sit together, that's strong enough. And when 50 sons of the prophets, when they say that together, and they say, do you know, you're acting as if you don't have knowledge. You're acting as if you don't understand what is going to happen to Elijah today. He said, you think I don't know? I know it, hold your peace. There are times we talk too much. I need to convince them that I know. I need to convince them I'm not an ignorant follower. I need to convince them and even tell them that I know more than they know. Now, why are you doing that? When you do that, Elijah is not going to wait for you. Elijah is moving on. I know it. And therefore you said, hold your peace. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, and the sons of the prophets, these were no mean fellows. These were people that knew what they were talking about. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha. Now, there was a school of the prophets, and those students were called the sons of the prophets, just like uh, Paul referred to Timothy and said, my son in the faith, just like uh, Paul referred to Titus, my son in the faith. All those students are in the school of the prophets. They were referred to as the sons of the prophets. They were there to learn uh, the prophetic ministry. They were there to learn how prophets act, how prophets minister, what prophets do. They were learning, but they never came uh, to the execution and the fulfillment of the knowledge they had. They had knowledge, but they didn't have the mind, the decision, the will to follow through with the uh, prophetic ministry they were preparing for. And it says, and the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today. There are ministers even now. They study prophecy 
very deeply. They don't study any other thing. They study the times and the seasons in which we are. They study all the signs we ought to see when the Lord will come. They are like, you know, they know the times and the seasons and the things that will happen and suddenly Christ will appear. They have the knowledge of the prophetic eschatology and the things that will come, but they do not have the knowledge of preparing for his coming. How is it? We're only studying prophecy, but we're not studying how to get ready for the time he will come. These people were students of prophecy, and they said, the Lord will take your master away from your head today. He answered, yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 it says, some 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and he stood to view a pharaoh. They stood to view a pharaoh that their prophecies were fulfilled, that what they had said to Elisha would be fulfilled. And they too went by Jordan. You see, the point is whatever the temptation, stay back, stand back, don't go further. You've done enough. Many voices may say that. And they may say that on the social media. They may say that in your local assembly. Stay. That's enough. What are you looking for? Those are temptations that come. And we need to know how to beat them. You will beat every temptation that comes your way in Jesus' name. Whatever the cause of those temptations. We, we don't look at the cause that is at the people bringing the temptation. We just know I must overcome. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. You'll be more than a conqueror in Jesus' name. I'm looking now at number three here. Number three is uh, bridling our tongues. We know well to bridle our own tongue. Can I bridle the tongue of somebody who is bothering me every time? Do you know I answered him? Another person come, a relative of his, do you know? And I bridle that tongue, and then I move forward. Every time I want to take another step forward, another step forward, another step forward. Are you reading the news? Yes, I do. Are you hearing what's happening? Yes, I hear. Do you know? Do you know? Do you know this? Yes, I know. But the conversation will not go beyond that. I have to bridle their tongue. If I don't, they will say more. If I don't, I might say something I shouldn't have said. Bridle your tongue. Bridle their tongue whenever they cross your vision. Whenever they cross your ministry, whenever they are saying something different from what Elijah had heard about you, Elisha, that the tongues that wag before the ordination and before the transfer of that power from Elijah unto Elisha, bridle those tongues. They say silence is golden. And at this time, uh, silence is golden. Here we come, uh, and we're going to exceed our previous limits. Power, greater power, greater anointing. Just as we are going out of the room, uh, somebody's, oh, brother, so and so, pastor, I've been looking for a chance to see you. I'm sorry I cannot talk now. There's a burden inside me. I need to go home. They've closed the meeting, but I've not closed my session of prayer. I need to get home now and pray it through. They say, no, please, please, please. I need your attention now. We must bridle their tongue. Because it is a moment for you, for Elisha, a moment that will never come again. We bridle their tongues whenever they cross our way. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 10, 
verse 19. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. In the multitudes of words, they are wanted not sin. Now, sin there, well, sometimes for the average people, normal, normal sin. For some sin, it wasn't just the sin of being with flesh, but the sin of revealing a secret. Even the secret he did not reveal to his father, to his mother, in the multitude of words, there wanted not sin. Oh, what's the sin? What's the wrong word? And what's the talkativeness that brings us down, that makes the power of God to leak away from our lives? In the multitude of words, there wanted not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise i'll be wise today i said i'll be wise today what are you thinking of are you thinking you're going to have the midst of elisha that question doesn't need an answer i'll be wise where are you coming from okay you were there exceeding limits tell me now what limits are you going to exceed the wise is quiet. I'll tell the Lord. I don't need to tell you. If I told you, are you going to help me to increase the power, to increase the anointing? What are you after now? What are you up to now? Okay, you've come to the place you are going to do what you've never done before. What's the point in answering him or answering her? Is he going to help me to achieve what I've never achieved? Bridle their tongue, bridle your tongue. When you get there, every one of us will see you are there. And you'll be there. I will be there. Uh, look at point number three. Point number three, we're looking at blessings for beneficiaries beyond his borders through God. You see the, the borders of Elisha in Israel, in Judah, he went beyond that. And the borders and the perimeter of the ministry of Elijah, he went beyond that. We're looking at uh, this under three perspectives. Number one, boundless blessings throughout the entire land. Boundless blessings through the entire land. You look at the whole land, the land of Israel, and you see the touch of Elisha there, the touch of Elisha there, the touch of Elisha everywhere in the entire land. Number two is borderless blessings, farther than earlier limitations, earlier limitations. All he did when Elijah was alive was that he was pouring water on Elijah's hands. And there are people, they'll say, what you couldn't do when Elijah was alive, when you were side by side with him, how do you think you can do that now that Elijah is gone? Don't worry, that's our calling, what we'll do. But less blessings farther than earlier limitations. Number three is breathless blessings beyond his earthly life. We hold our breath. We see Elisha moving on and making the bitter water sweet. We hold our breath and then telling the kings how the victory will come for them we hold our breath. Telling the woman that had a pot of oil and the creditors have come to take the children and he said, what do you have at home? I don't have anything except a pot of oil. This has never happened before. But go borrow empty vessels, not a few, and lock your door and begin to pour. And begin to pour. And this one full, this one filled up, that one overflowing. And he told one of the children, bring me more. And they said, there is none more. And then the oil stayed. And he told the man of God, I filled up all these. What do I do now? Go sell and pay all your debt. All your debts are paid in Jesus' name. And then eat and feed your family 
of the rest. And we see a Naaman coming. If my Lord will go to the prophet in Samaria, he'll be cured of his leprosy. And then he got there, you know the story. Go dip yourself seven times in Jordan and your flesh will come again. After the initial deliberations and argument and debate, he went in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then the flesh came back again. Leprosy was gone, and then we we'll see Gehazi coming. Where are you coming from? Thy servant went nowhere. Did I not see you when you ran after that man? Is this the time to have vineyards and all that? Now the leprosy of Naaman came, come upon you, and the man went out and was white like snow. And then we have uh, the Assyrians fighting against the Israelites, and Elisha, Elisha was in his home, and he said that, uh, to go tell the king, the king of Syria is waging war with you and is waiting in that place. And then he escaped, and second time he escaped. And uh, so the king of Syria said, Will you not tell me who is causing all this, reporting every plan we have, every strategy of war to the king in Samaria? There's no other man. There's one prophet there, Elisha. Everything you say in your bedroom, he hears everything and he tells tells the king, look at this man beyond his borders, and there was famine in that land, to the point that they were even cooking their own children and eating, and the king said, you know, God do so to me, and more also, if the head of Elijah is not taken away to and Elijah was just in Zoom, and there were people, elders with him, he said, see that son of the Modra, and he says to take my head when he comes, at the gate, hold him there. And then he said, as the Lord leave it tomorrow, there will be a place surplus, a witch in the land. And the man on whom the, uh, the king at least said, if God will open the windows of heaven, might that be? And then he said, you will see it with your eyes, but you will not eat thereof. And it was so exactly that Asia said, everything was for field in the life in the ministry of Elisha. As you look at Elisha, he went beyond every ministry that had been before him. Eventually now, you know, since he didn't go by the rapture, by the chariots, he must go by, you know, the way everybody goes, and he died. After he died, you will think, well, he had a good ministry. That was great. Look at all that he did. And the king even came to him in that final, on that final day. My father, my father, the chariot of Israel. And he said, okay, open the window. And he shoots the arrows. He shot three times. Strike now on the ground. And he struck one, two, three. And he stopped. And the man of God was wrought with him. Why did you stop the striking? Why did you stop the prayer? If you didn't stop, you would have overcome beyond your limits. In any case, you're now overcome three times. And Elisha was gone. But his ministry had not gone. I said his ministry had not gone. And so they buried him. And it was still an open sepulchre. They had not covered it up. And some people were taking a dead man. And when they were taking that dead man to go and bury, they saw a band coming after them. And without prayer, without expectation, and without any asking for a miracle, they dropped the dead man on the grave of Elisha. And when that dead body got to the grave and touched the body of Elisha. Elisha was still there, but the man got up. I thought you'd say good amen. amen. The ministry went beyond his very life. Well, we've spoken a lot about Elisha. Now, we have to talk about you. I said we have to talk about you. Your moment has come. Amen. That will bond with Christ 
a benefactor and that he will baptize you in his love, in his power, in his anointing. And I know that because you are here today, and you are not just here, God ordained that you will be here today. He knew what you will hear. He knew what you will implant in your heart. He knew the desire that will rise in your heart and is here to make it happen on your life on your ministry. A new level has now come. A new anointing has now come. A new power has now come. Let no voice hinder you. This is the moment of receiving. Rise up and tell the Lord boundless blessings in your ministry. Borderless blessings in your ministry. Breathless blessings even beyond the earthly life. Open your mouth and tell the Lord, don't let anything stop you. Don't let any thought stop you. Don't let any idea stop you. Don't let your past stop you. Your present and your future will be greater, will be higher than what you ever saw in the past. It's a new anointing. It's a fresh anointing. It is a heavenly anointing coming upon your life and coming upon your head today. When Elisha left the yoke of oxen, he never knew, he never knew what was coming ahead. But then, as he followed on, as he followed on, as he followed on, the power came, the anointing came, the new ministry came. Today is your day. Today is the appointed day for you. Burn the bridge behind. Build the bridge that gets you to the future engagement. Break down the barriers that cut others from a fruitful enlistment. Nothing will hinder you. And don't hinder yourself. No unbelief. No side talks, no limitation upon your life, no limitation upon your ministry. The future will be greater than the past. Bond together. Get closer to Christ. Get closer to your benefactor. Bond together. Nothing between you and Christ. Nothing between you and the baptizer. Nothing between you and your benefactor. Beach the temptations in your mind. Be beach the temptations. You are tired, aren't you? Beach that temptation. You are thirsty, aren't you? Beach that temptation. Others are talking about you. Do you know? Beach that temptation. Bridle the tongues. 
your own tongue, bridle. Don't say what you used to say, bridle your tongue. They talk of discouragement. They talk of anxiety. They talk of worry. Bridle your tongue. And bridle the other tongues as well. Those tongues that will crush you, bridle them. That will cross your way, bridle them. That will take away your heart, your passion, bridle them. Get ready for a borderless ministry, boundless ministry, breathless ministry. Get ready. The Lord is for you as you are for the Lord. You will exceed limits. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Would you raise up your hands? Can I just remind you that when that mantle fell, Elisha did not feel any emotion. It's not on the basis of how we feel on our emotion. Elisha did not hear any audible voice. Elisha did not see any painted vision on the canvas, but he knew my mantle has come. Amen. Feeling or no feeling, heat or cold, a feeling to cry or a feeling to smile or to laugh, whatever the feeling, understand without any spoken voice your mantle has come upon you it's the action it's what you do after this mantle dividing uh, the jordan river it's what you do that will let us know he has got that spirit Amen. quality quantity power irresistible. Amen. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Amen. Lord, we are not an accident. Amen. My brother, my sister there, you are not an accident. Amen. You are here at this time for good purpose. You are here because open heavens is now shining and smiling upon you. Amen. Your past is gone. Amen. Good past, that's in the hands of the Lord. Amen. Bad past, that's in the hands of the Lord. Amen. You come out a new creature, Amen. a new minister, Amen. a new man, Amen. a new woman, with a new anointing upon your life now in Jesus' name. Amen. Block out the thoughts of the past. Amen. Bridle the tongues of the past. Amen. Stop the things 
that will stop you and rise up in new strength with new anointing with new power they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they will mount up with wings as eagles you will run you will not be weary you will walk and you will not faint because the God of heaven now brings new power, new anointing upon your life. Amen. Go and do what you are ordained to do. Amen. Lord, I pray the mantle of power, the mantle of anointing, the mantle of signs and wonders, and the mantle of preaching, proclaiming the word with power. Come upon everyone now in Jesus' name. Amen. Through you, many souls will come into the kingdom. Amen. Through you, many hopeless lives will become hopeful. Amen. And through you, the work of God will be done and will go further in your borders here and beyond your borders in Jesus' name. Amen irresistible power Amen. irrefutable power Amen. come upon everyone now Amen. whether we feel it or not Lord I pray the faith to know that we got what you gave that faith will be in every heart right now Amen. we're going out to do what you have newly now appointed ordained for us to do. Amen. We'll see new things we've never seen. Amen. We'll do new things we've never done. Amen. We'll go new places we have never gone. Amen. Every brother, every sister, confirmation in your life. Amen. Demonstration in your life. Amen. Lord, manifest yourself beyond our previous limits. Amen. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah.